Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome yet again to another episode of the Business of Music Radio, tbmradioshow.com. I am Brian Choper. Uh, many of you already know who I am. I am a drummer. I own Big Shot Records, and we are doing this show uh, every other week in order to uh, get people to understand what the music business is all about, to to learn uh, people's perspectives of the music business and of bands from the stage, from the point of view of the audience, and to interview interesting people in the music business. And Mickey, why don't you say hello? Hi, I'm Mickey Hill of Support Live Music DC, also of Photo Tracks by Mickey Hill, which is an event photography company. Uh, myself and my business partner, Jeevon Brown, we've been in business for about 20 years. Jeevon is also a musician. He plays keyboards and bass. Maybe one day we can get him in here to give his uh, perspective of being a musician as well as a photographer, but not on this particular session. And we do different events as well. I have support live music also, which my goal is to highlight the different musicians vocalists, and entertainers in the Washington, D.C. area so that the artists, so that the, not only the artists, but the public and also the people who own businesses, restaurants, they will know that you can um, get some quality musicians right here in the D.C. area. There are also a lot of talented musicians, artists, and entertainers in other areas, but for those who want to use the local artists, we want to make sure that they know who they are. And of course, you will be giving us uh, updates as to other artists that you've uh, looked into or seen in the last week? Yes, I will. So, in our fourth episode, uh, we interviewed uh, our first part of our uh, of an interview with Lou Durham, who is uh, ex-Army band, and uh, well, he's he's got such a history, a rich history, that we, we spent an hour on him last week talking with him, and uh, we are going to continue with that discussion this week, uh, it, right now, including uh, talking about how to write a song. He's going to play some of his music on the air for you and uh, go into more of his biography and, and, and some of the people he's played with. Well, Lou, why don't you say hello again? How are you doing? So, uh, Mickey, where are we with uh, with with some of this? You, you had some things you wanted to... Uh, to bring up is that true yes on our agenda today the subject is how to write a song mm -hmm. and Lou is actually going to play a song for us that he has written a song or two maybe we can get him to play three we'll see well we <laughs> last last week we knew that as we were talking with him uh, name, name name three or four of the five the what top musicians you you've you've said you you mentioned last week that you had recorded with certain people oh geez I've uh, <clears throat> I've played with a lot of R&B guys that were big in the 70s and the 80s, uh, like Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, and uh, Eddie Holman from the Philadelphia area. Uh, in the USO tours that I did while I was in the United States Army Band, I worked with Daryl Worley and Mark Wills and Craig Morgan, a uh, few different country stars. Now, you said you played with them, but did you rec who did you record with? Oh, recording? Um, actually, I was involved in writing and recording... Uh, one recording session with Chuck Brown, who was doing a project with a friend of mine, uh, which was a New Orleans-style street band kind of concept, and he was he was singing with that with that band. Uh, they are from D.C. called the A la Carte Brass and Percussion Group. I don't I'm not quite sure if they're still uh, active, but their CDs are out there. So you were with Chuck Brown, just on one recording session. Okay, Chuck he came, Brown. And he, he came and recorded with modest. that particular act. He also was an excellent jazz artist. I heard his jazz CD, and I was kind of blown away. Oh, yeah. So the, what the, did you record with? Papa was Chuck. a Rolling Stone. Right. is one of them. Um, <laughs> I think I've Been Loving You Too Long, which is an Otis Redding tune. Wow, yes. One of my, two of my yeah. favorites, yeah. I think that's about the, uh, I think that's the two that I Where were you? That. Where did I do that yeah. at? Uh, here in Maryland, actually. It was in Rockville. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Got um, it. The group is based out of uh, D.C., right across the, the, the line from D.C. into Maryland, uh, off of Connecticut Avenue. Gotcha. gotcha. So everyone was from this, this particular area right mm -hmm. around here. Now, 
There were three things we promised our audience right off the bat uh, as we were closing the last show because we ran out of time and we, I kind of knew that we were not going to be able to do all this in one hour. Uh, but one was to, to, to have them hear a, a, a song or two from you. Sure. We mentioned patriotic songs. We mentioned original songs. And then we talked about writing a song. Okay. Okay. So maybe since people have already had to wait this long to to hear this, maybe we want to go ahead and why don't you uh, uh, why don't you go ahead and play uh, one of my original patriotic yeah, one of first? your original patriotic songs. Now, okay. now, did you play this in the army too, or did you? Yeah, write this? I actually wrote this with the army, and uh, I got I got the chance. I was the only non I was hired as a pianist there, not a writer, uh-huh. not a singer. Okay. But I, I got the opportunity to premiere this at a uh, 1812 concert that the Army does every year down at the Washington Monument. Right. And, uh, and then the thing was performed at uh, Carnegie Hall. We did it all over the place. It was recorded. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then this particular one I'll play for you today is called America Means Everything to Me. Mm-hmm. And then a little later in the show, maybe I'll, uh, I'll play one of my other... Right, you because know, because what I think Mickey also, you know, you're talking about writing songs. Mickey Mickey did some research, which I think is interesting to see, because she, she went online and did some research about how people's perspectives on how a song is written. And we're, I was going to ask her to, to talk a little bit about that. Yes, we can talk a little bit about that, and then I'm going to ask Brian and Lou their take on it, because they actually do write songs. But many times people will say, what do you do first? Do you do the music first? Do you do the words first? You know, where should I start? Sometimes it's the music and sometimes it's the lyrics. That is the short answer. It depends on the person who is writing the song. It is suggested that you write based on a title, idea, or a lyrical book. You want to remember to make sure that everything in your lyric points to and supports your lyrical hook. Having a catchy hook only works if you build a foundation around it so that when the hook arrives, there's a sense of drama and release. Don't forget to give the song real emotional content. It's possible to be so focused on the hook and setting that you forget to be sincere. While the average listener might not be able to tell you why, the song won't move them in the way that a song with genuine emotional content would. I think that that is an awful lot of information. Mm-hmm. I think that sometimes, um, sometimes a, a lyricist will write lyrics, and you are inspired to write a song from the lyrics. I know personally, I keep a little book with me everywhere I go, and if I see something interesting or uh, hear something interesting, even if it's on TV or watching a movie or, or whatever, I'll jot that idea down and then revisit it whenever. You know, and sometimes I am actually inspired to, to write a song from, from that. It may be weeks, weeks later, maybe years. Uh, but I, I do keep a, a book like that. Um, so <clears> you <throat> actually me. live and breathe music every day, oh, everywhere yeah, you constantly. go, everything and, and, you do. And, and the same thing that I would say from what you, what you read, my first thought was when I've thought of a tune or done this, I can't necessarily tell you what sparks that or why I thought of that topic or that melody. Sometimes it's a melody, sometimes it's a lyric. So I can't necessarily say that any of that necessarily is right, but it's one person's perspective on maybe what someone thinks about when they're thinking about, am I a songwriter? I think, I think that's maybe better for someone who's thinking, do I have what it takes to write a song? And you have to almost get them to think, you know, Go to the beach, and does it come to you? Sit on your patio, does it come to you? Ride a roller coaster, does it come to you? Lou, tell me if you... you... Sometimes sometimes it comes down to, like, I was stranded in Concord, New Hampshire one night, and uh, trying to find something to eat, and everything closes in the capital of New Hampshire by 10 o'clock at night. It's not just New Hampshire where this happens. (laughs) I was in Pittsburgh, (laughs) Pennsylvania, and this happened to me. Everything closed at 8. So... Basically, I'm walking around, and I saw on the side of a building, um, like a, it was a very old, like stone building, and and someone had painted a sign with an arrow, and it said 21st Street Mission. And I jotted it down in my book, and that's been a good 10 years ago. And just recently, uh, for a rock and roll project I'm working with uh, for Big Shot Records, 
I just pulled that out and started writing a lyrics based on someone who is like, you know, down on their luck and they're on the streets and they have to go to this mission to get something to eat. But they know that when they go to this mission to get something to eat, they're going to have to listen to someone preach to them and tell them how they should think. See, it was a food bank. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the E Street Band. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and so I, I kind of like wrote a rock and roll tune based off of that. I mean, that particular night I also uh, saw a church steeple that was beautiful. And, and on the side of the church it said Angel of Peace Catholic Church. And I wound up writing a song called Angel of Peace. Sometimes it's that way. Sometimes I'll sit down and write subject matter like, like we're writing a prose for an English composition class and write a story. And from that story, a song might come. And then I start wheedling down the story and getting rid of all the useless words in the articles and creating lyrics out of that. Sometimes you might uh, create a, you had said to, to create a hook. There are many hooks. A hook can be considered the chorus of a song. A hook can be considered a lyric that you say over and over again. Uh, sometimes rhythmic hooks. Like I'll create a rhythmic hook. Or if I'm stuck for a rhythmic hook, I'll listen to some uh, samples and see where they're coming from. And then all of a sudden, I'm inspired to write something based off of what I just heard. So is a hook the same thing as a refrain? No. Okay. No, a hook, uh, a refrain, I mean, that's, that's, that's like old songwriting talking. Yes, it is. A uh, refrain, <laughs> a song would have like a beginning that was like totally different and had nothing to do with the rest of the song. Uh, AKA, I left my heart in San Francisco. The whole beginning of that song, no one ever knows because that's the refrain. That's the thing that sets up the part that everybody knows, which is the hook, you know, and that whole song is a hook based off of the words, I left my heart in San Francisco. When you hear that first line, you know exactly who it is and you know exactly what it is. But a refrain is more like the setup, you know, and uh, and a song will sometimes have specific forms. I mean, sometimes it'll be like the verse and then a chorus, and they would call that like, you know, in musical form, the A and the B of a song. It may have the verse, the chorus, it may have a bridge, that would be considered the C. So there are musical forms. Um, and you can either adhere to a specific musical form that is listed on a piece of paper, or you can just like sit down and write and then decide where you're going with the forms as you're going. Uh, so the answer is that <clears throat> there's good information on the internet, obviously, to give you hints, but you know, it really comes down to what's happening at the moment, you know, and what you do with it, you know, and some people may sit down and write lyrics and they think they have to, everything has to rhyme and, mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it sounds sing-songy, kind of wishy-washy, sort of, you know, a supposed love song just becomes silly, you know? Maybe that's why Paul McCartney wrote silly love songs. <laughs> Who knows? You know, but um, okay. basically, I think that uh, I think that writing a song can come from... I, I showed you something just before we started. I said, pick out five notes on yes, the piano. Yes, Lou wrote a song in 10 seconds, and <laughs> I'm ready I to know. publish it, and I'm ready to copyright well, we're it. Gonna, we're going to... <laughs> We're gonna try to emulate that again. You know? So, so uh, I, I, I guess the first thing to do is, is, is go on to your next point, okay, Mickey. And then after we do that, uh, let's have Lou play something. Okay. The next point is writing based on general idea or lyrical concept. Sometimes you've been through an experience or having an idea for a song that may feel important to you, and you want to write about it. It is suggested that you capture the feeling and emotion of your concept. You obviously felt strongly enough to want to write about this idea, so immerse yourself in it and really tell the story. Mm -hmm. Don't be too vague. Because you haven't started with an actual lyric hook, you need to remember to bring your overall concept to a very sharp point by summarizing it with a phrase or book line. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I ah, just don't know what to say. I don't know what to say about I, that. Um, it almost sounds like someone is. It sounds like a college high, course. So someone is high about about, about emotionally getting other people to think about yeah. how to write a song. But, I don't but know. But they're it's, overthinking uh, this. Yeah, I think that uh, I think that basically what what's going on here is that uh, 
uh, it sounds like a, the beginning of a textbook for a college course. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you have no no clue whatsoever as to what you're doing. But that's not how, that's not what music is about. No, no, no it's yeah. not that generic, you know. And it's, um, I mean, it's not like, <clears throat> you, excuse me, you go to school for accounting and, and so you take X amount of courses and after four years you know how to do that job and you have a piece of paper that says you know how to do that job and you go do that job. And everybody does it the same way. Yes. Because that's the way it is. But that's not the way it is with art or music or acting or anything. If I were a songwriter, I don't think I would have a general idea. I think I would write it based on how I felt or what I saw at the time. Well, what I like about what you read, at least for people out there who know, who don't understand songwriting at all, which Mm -hmm. is most people, at least, at least they're getting a concept of the things that we're thinking about as we're writing a song. If nothing else, it's giving them an idea of, you know, where the where the the ideas come from. But I think I think that from the artist's point of view, it's just it's not that easy. It's not that simple. You, you things things come to you. What what that does is help somebody think, hey, I'd like to try to write a song. Maybe someone wants who's listening to this wants to try to write a song, and so we've given them some ideas of how they can get ideas as to what to write. I think that that might actually be something yeah. useful. Thank you for joining us, and you can listen to this podcast and any previous podcasts at www.tbmradioshow.com. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Let's 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 let them hear what you're all about. What are you gonna do? I'll do a patriotic song that I wrote. Um, basically, I heard somebody say, "America means everything to me," so I jotted that down in my book, mm-hmm. and I left that there for a while. And then I started to write lyrics based off of that one sentence that I heard. When I got to the point of the chorus where I wanted to create a hook, then I thought, well, let me. Let me like sh- take something from the national anthem, you know, maybe not e- the exact inter- interval intervals that are going on in, in the melody of the national anthem, but maybe uh, saying something in the lyrics like "Oh say can you see" that people would immediately realize that's that, catchy, right? Yeah, that I was referencing the national anthem and then taking it from there. And this is like a, the one that I was talking about that's. I wrote and I got the chance as a singer to stand in front of our orchestra and premiere it at the 1812 concert that we did. And I can't remember what year that would have been, but they all kind of like washed together after a while. But, uh, yep, I can do that one. Okay. Let's have Lou play America Means Everything to Me. Which is one of his original patriotic songs. In the stillness of the darkest night America shines through And just remember who you are This will take you very far Through two hundred years of history A common thread still binds our soul And for the things that we believe And for the love of liberty For the right to live in freedom we sing Oh, say can you see 
land of the free Purple mountains majesty That's America Always there for you and me How I'd fight to keep you free America means everything to me And when the founding fathers walked this land And they were filled with so much pride In a nation being born With patriotic hopes and dreams We are bound to them for all time Their beliefs, our destiny For the things that we believe for the love of liberty and for the right to live in freedom we sing oh say can you see oh well the land of the free and purple mountains majesty and that's america always there for you and me how i'd fight to keep you America means everything to me Well, America, your light, it shines so bright You know it means so much, oh, so many Marching through the ages, we will sing We will sing Oh, say, can you see? For the land of the free and Purple mountains majesty And that's America Always there for you and me How I'd fight to keep you free America means everything to me America means everything to me Now that's America Means Everything to Me, as you could tell. Now, one thing I wanted to point out to the audience is that uh, you say, you're, you're playing that as a ballad tune, but that was really meant as a power ballad, where yes. it's, it's, it's starting off ballad and then it kicks into a, like a, a heavy duty a heavy rock, duty rock band right. type of thing, which people on listening may not quite get because of, of, of the fact that it was only on piano. Sure. But this is a rock and roll song. That you wrote there, okay? Basically, yeah. Basically a patriotic rock and roll song, okay, that you wrote. So, um, obviously, people can see the passion in what you just did. you have any questions, Mickey, or did you just like it? I'm still in awe. Yeah, oh, she's in awe. Okay. It's a great tune. It's a great tune, and, we sh and we're going to do something with it with the company. So, let's go ahead now. Now, that is a, 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 a an original tune. We talked about earlier uh, uh, what inspires people to think of a tune to write you know That's we talked right. about that we spent a bit of time last last section talk, talking about that and now and now we've we, we, we got into the patriotic because obviously he's a veteran yes. obviously in the armed forces had reasons to write that but now we're gonna go ahead and and, and hear him do a tune that was truly a, a, an original just that came from well tell tell us how did you think of this how did you come up with this i now had written down on a, in my little book i had written down what does it feel like to be dumped by somebody you really love okay and then i wound up that's writing not a, a new song. that's not a new topic no but i mean 80 percent of all songs written are love songs yeah or 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 breakup songs or breakup songs yeah, so you know or wanting somebody's song. If it isn't about the right. dog in the back of your pickup truck and all that kind I of i mean stuff. joe jackson wrote a song called is she really going out with him which mm -hmm. is a great song right Right. So, yeah, this one's called Baby, Please Come Back to Me. Mm -hmm. From a real life experience, I'm assuming. Well, we all have those experiences. Yes. yes. Okay. We've all been dumped once or twice or yes. half a dozen, maybe okay. 24 times. What do you think? Okay. 
I'm not commenting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so would you like me to yes, go yes, ahead and do please. this? While I sit alone late at night I drink my brandy very slowly Thinking about our love And what went wrong And while I lie awake in my bed You know you're always on my mind I just can't sleep because I need you here I never thought I'd feel this way I always thought I could walk away I guess I'm wrong Guess I'm wrong Baby, please come back to me And I can't stand another night Like this again I feel inside I'm fighting a losing battle I just can't win And if I come across A picture That I have of you I feel so cold Something's gone inside I never thought I'd feel this way I would walk away I guess I'm wrong Guess I'm wrong Baby, please come back to me I can't stand another night Like this again Oh, baby Baby, please come back to me I can't live without you Baby, please come back to me. And that will be released, I guess, in the next 60 days on uh, Big Shot Records. Oh, very Publishing. good. Awesome. So we've got that going on. Now, again, another power ballad, right? Yes. So, I do write other things than power ballads. I know. I'm, no. just, I'm just pointing it out because people aren't hearing a band around you. But, 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 but this, this shows that you know an artist, by the way, songwriters have to know how to perform their music two publishers um 
even if they don't have a band, and this is something that if you're if you're out there thinking about writing a song like we're talking about today, people who want to try it. And by the way, Mickey, you should we should make sure that people if if they want to try it, send us an email if they want help if they have a song if they if they're looking. You know, I think we probably would be willing to help someone if if they think that they can do this or if they are doing this if they're songwriters. Yes, we 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 would encourage people to try. Or if they are a songwriter and they want to do something with it, what I call a filing cabinet writer, they, they, they write things, don't know what to do with it, and put it in the filing cabinet. Lots of people like this. Let us know. Maybe there's something good out there. Maybe there's an un, unknown talent out there that we can discover. So That's a great offer and a great opportunity. Yeah, so, so um, basically uh, you have to... Uh, be able to write this stuff, but then you're not just going to be able to find someone to play it for you. So if you want people to hear your music, unless you're going to put together a band of your own originals and just for the sake of, of, of recording something that you hope may be heard by somebody else, you kind of have to uh, be able to play your music on your own, which is what you're, you're hearing Lou do. That's right. Okay, now now obviously with, with Big Shot Publishing... Uh, uh, we're going to be able to take that and 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 go into the studio and and do a, and do a rock and, and put the band together. We already have that in the works, and 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 uh, record that and do the video and whatnot, have you, and let people hear the stuff. And this is part of what we're going to do for Lou because he has a lot of this music that he hasn't done a lot of this w- of, of, of a lot with. So many so many writers are like that, and we're taking this stuff and we're getting it published for him. So so talking about this and talking about writing music Lou <clears throat> let's let's get into that you just showed them one of your tunes or well, two of your tunes a one 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 that you that you had to figure out what to do with but you already knew you wanted to write a patriotic tune to write that patriotic tune correct right and then you the original which came out came to mind when it was right for you to write it it got to the point where in the very beginning I I had been in the band in Atlanta Georgia and I had written two patriotic songs while there Mm-hmm. Uh, back in the early 90s. When I came to the United States Army Band, I presented it to my officer in charge of the group that I was in at the time. Mm-hmm. And he told me that uh, the Army Band wasn't interested in doing any original patriotic <laughs> at all. Okay. So <clears throat> I kind of did the end around, which I'm not supposed to do, mm-hmm. and uh, offhandedly mentioned it to the colonel in charge of the band Mm -hmm. in a hallway Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he called me into his office and i said sir here it is and i gave him it back then a vhs tape of what the ground forces command in atlanta had done with one of my songs and uh, i also gave him a tape of the other one that i had written at that time Mm -hmm. and he decided right then and there they were going to record it and they made a patriotic cd and named it after the song it was called the flag still flies high the 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 message is don't give up when don't one give person up. says no right I I mean, even though absolutely. you're in a situation where you're, you're really not supposed to breach the chain of command with well but you got to be aggressive with your music right you've got to do it you you and and, everybody uh, that that's to the world now and after after you got to be aggressive after you can't that, let Brian, one person what, say what no. occurred was after that uh, it was played for the um, Every year there's a big army convention okay. uh, in D.C. And the, the guy that was in charge of uh, organizing the event, it was a three-day event, so mm-hmm. you know, link court, you know, like an opening ceremony type thing with art orchestra playing patriotic stuff and a little pop package before they opened their ceremony. Uh, there was different groups going over and performing during the two, three days, and then the big gala dinner at the end of this convention. The guy started to call me and say, you got a new, new patriotic for the opening of the uh, AUSA concert, uh-huh. which is the Army's big... Big show. Big show. And so I would say, sure, what do you have in mind? You know, and It got to the point where he would mention subjects to me and I would sit down and just write a story about it and then wind up writing a tune. Um, mm-hmm. There was a... Uh, one time he said to me, at the time it was General Shinseki was the... The, the general who was the army's chief of staff of the army. And uh, he had he had given a speech, and this speech he was going to also give at the convention in the opening ceremony, and this this contact I had with, uh, with the event 
wanted me to write a, a song that would incorporate some of the words of his speech into the song. So I wound up doing that. I mean, I actually got the word technology into a song. That was kind of difficult, but uh, there, that was that was a situation <clears throat> where, you know, I was being asked to do to do that now. Mm-hmm. You know. Did you have something? Yes, and I have met Mr. Shinseki. Oh, oh, yeah. Where? How? How? At the Department of Veterans Affairs. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's a small world, isn't it? It is a small world, yes. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, you're, you're talking about all of these situations where you're writing a song, either because it came to mind or because um, you knew that it could be used for a reason like the patriotic, or in a sense you could say you were commissioned in a way. Commissioned with no pay. Well, well okay, <laughs> but you were asked to write a song yeah. and given... Uh, the theme, and and even right. given was, some of the lyrics. It was very good for my career to do so. Yeah, you know, sure, sure. And they're damn good. So why yeah, not? Thank you. <laughs> so 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 now we're getting into the the an interesting part of this conversation, which is how you write a song, and um, you were you were fooling around with uh, with Mickey's brain a few minutes ago. Asking her what to give you. Why don't Why don't you share with uh, well? I asked the her audience. to show me. I asked her to show me a random five notes mm-hmm. on the piano. This is sometimes how I I kind of stir myself, you know, to to get out of a rut. Yeah. You know. Now she chose A flat, C, E flat, F, and B flat. Now you notice that he remembered that. So as soon as she yes. chose those notes, I just kind of like went. That's kind of cool. And then I just went, I put in a minor. Pretty little melody. And I, just, I couldn't do it again. But that I that right. just incorporated the five notes that she asked me to. Right now, that's that's about. that's writing a song from the melody first. From the melody first. Now, how about if you have to go from the lyrics first? Then I <clears throat> would have to sit and read the lyrics, and most likely, if it's not a complete lyric, if it's just a story or a composition or, or an idea, and then I'd have to sit there and think about. Um, how to do that. I mean, I recently rewrote something that I wrote a long, long time ago mm-hmm. uh, for one of our projects mm-hmm. uh, for a female vocalist. And, um, you know, basically I had to sit down and think about where the melody was going and in some places change the melody to fit what I was writing lyrically. Mm-hmm. Now, I've, I've heard of some people saying that they take lyrics that they're given and, and they and they simply uh, uh, start by... Uh, by singing them as though they're saying them in 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 song, sure, because it's a story. It's a story, and and that's what uh, like I've heard Elton John does that. Mm-hmm. He always gets the lyrics first, and then he he starts singing them in a way where he's like telling the story, and that's why they always sound like a story because they're 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 a story. There may be someone else's story, but he's the storyteller. Right. See, so so uh, have you ever done that? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Yes, that's one of the ways. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we, I'm, I'm glad we fit this in because I wanted to do this for the last week. Uh, we're going to take a break and come back. And when we come back, we're going to get back into uh, uh, your, your story, your bio, which we never finished last week. Okay. Just one little thing before we go. Okay. I read something in Rolling Stone quite, quite a few years ago. Uh, sort of about Paul McCartney being interviewed and asked about writing songs. Mm -hmm. And he talked about yesterday and how he woke up in the morning and he had that melody in his head and he was trying to come up with lyrics and he was standing at his stove making scrambled eggs and he was thinking, scrambled eggs, 
So basically, that song got written out of scrambled eggs. Well, so did uh, my, uh, Barry Manilow's Mandy got written out of about a his thunder, dog, right? Thunderstorm and a, and a yeah. thunderstorm, a dog and a yeah, and howl. howl. There you go. So that means if I'm not careful, I will be a songwriter. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be right back. Okay, we're back again. Brian Choper with the Business of Music Radio, TBMRadioShow.com, and uh, Lou. We're we're back. We're back catching up uh, from a week ago when we were talking about the beginnings of your of your story about starting to to play at three or four or five years old or whatnot. Have you? No, I was five. You were five years old. No, seriously. Not seriously. I mean, yeah. I seriously. Got started when I was eight, but I mean five. I was okay, okay. already okay. So you were, so you were as much as a five-year-old can do. Okay. Right. So when did you get glasses? When I was twelve. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you started playing music before you had glasses. Yes. There you go. See, I'm I'm just joking. And so we had talked about some musicians that perform locally, nationally, and internationally, and Lou is one of those musicians. He has performed everywhere. Can you tell us a little bit? More about that, Lou? Well, when I was 18, I started uh, playing on the East Coast, mm-hmm. basically the Jersey Shore scene. So I was working in Wildwood, New Jersey. How old were you there? I was 18. So, okay. And uh, I always worked with guys that were like four or five year old, years older than me. I don't know why that was, but I was always the kid in the band. You know, that because when I was 18, 19, the average person I was working with was 30. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know why either. It just No, it just happened that way. Right. Unfortunately, that's not the way it is now, but that's okay. You know, a time for every season, right? Yep. But um, so I worked with different rock and roll shows. Uh, they were doing like uh, one hour shows of like Yes and Jethro Tull, I can remember, and uh, bands like that. You know, we didn't, we did the, it was a cover show, basically. So you were like a tribute for an hour show for a certain band. Okay. Uh, I was also with a band that was like an R&B review that did a lot of James Brown stuff and had front man up front that knew how to do all the moves. So when you were doing the tribute thing, you weren't just, it wasn't just one band doing, it was it was a it was a different artist that you were... You would usually, I mean, you worked a whole summer long. I mean, I worked 77 straight nights. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So you were with a band that, um, that was doing the same two shows every night. Got it. I mean, this is not as glamorous as people might think. Nope, it's... Especially when you have to do the same songs all if the time you, and all sure. the time and all the time. I know. And you have to be as psyched every night that you do it. It's the audience that gets you into it, right? It's the audience. Yeah. Right. And and what and when you were doing tribute, what bands were you? Yes. Okay. Jethro Tull. Okay. Uh, Led Zeppelin. Okay. Uh, we were doing. Uh, I'm trying to think, Jesus, so long ago. This is not simple stuff. That's complicated. stuff. No, this is complicated music. Yeah. Sure. And. Um, Sometimes we would do like one or two different kinds of groups at once. I can remember doing an awful lot of Eagles uh, during the day. Fun. Uh, And then I sort of got away from the rock scene and started getting into, I mean, music changed and disco became the thing. And, you know, I worked in a lot of bands that were dance bands working disco clubs. And we wound up turning ourselves into like a funk slash disco type act. And then started through an agency opening for some name disco acts and things like that. Did you like the disco? Um, some of it, okay. sure. So were you were you morphing the sound because you needed to sound different, or was it because you wanted to? Because there's a certain thing that's called art, <laughs> and then there's a certain thing that's called business. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, the business of music means that sometimes you play what you don't want to play. Uh, basically, all of those experiences have taught me that there is good in everything. I can't listen to anything and, and say, I hate that. That's, that's terrible. I, I don't like that kind of music. I, I this, I that. And to hear someone say that, I think is shallow. Mm -hmm. There is good in everything. I mean, I just did a country gig two weeks ago where I sat and I played basically power chords on a piano all night long, which means that I left all the thirds out, and so you can't tell if it's major or minor. Mm -hmm. It's just sort of like honking along with the guitar players, and we're playing three note, three chord songs, you know, and it's all about the groove and the feel and mm -hmm. the excitement that the lyric, especially in country, that the lyric presents. Mm -hmm. You know, I hadn't done a country gig for a while, so I kind of really enjoyed that, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you have to know the styles. Yes, you have to know this, but, and but, what to do. Right. So that was the business side, but did you enjoy that anyway? I enjoyed it anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. So do you play every genre of music, Lou? The only thing that I will not tackle at this stage of the game is uh, classical music gigs. And the oh. reason why? Because uh, a long time ago I realized that uh, it takes an awful lot of your time to learn how to do these classical pieces exactly the way they are written down and the way people expect them to be for not very much money. <laughs> and I was in college and I realized that out of 55 piano majors, there was three of us that could do anything but play a classical piece of music. <laughs> and so I switched my major to commercial jazz piano and took myself out of the classical world because I'd like to be a major league pitcher too. You know, I love baseball. But that's not going to happen. Right. So what makes me think that I can be one of the, gosh knows, whatever percentage it is, of people born on this earth who have the ability to be a concert pianist? Mm -hmm. You know, the rest of them all become church musicians, well, or the, they teach in chorus. The musicians who want to do the classical, I think... That's what they want. That's what their zone is. And then that's, they should go there. That's right. That's what I'm saying. For you, you you were just. You, you, I can tell your 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 interests are so all are so diversified, that 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 would have strangled you. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Plus, I kind of like believe in uh, being creative, and sometimes in that world, when you're when you're learning in that world, I remember getting thrown out of a teacher's studio in Glassboro uh, when I went to Rowan University because. He listened to me play a Chopin Nocturne in F minor. That it was part of that particular semester's curriculum. It was we were learning Chopin, Bach, and Beethoven. I'm sorry, not Beethoven, Mozart. And uh, so I was working on this Nocturne. And I went in and I played it. And this guy sarcastically says to me, you are interpreting that piece of music completely wrong, and this and this and this and this. And I said to him, uh, Doctor, were you alive when Chopin was alive? And he looks at me, and he says, what do you mean? And I said, how do you know what Chopin meant for this to sound like? There's no recordings. There's not even a metronome marking to tell you how fast it goes. It's what people say it's supposed to be, and that's supposed to be taken as the gospel. And I believe that Chopin would love it if he heard somebody take their music and interpret it in their way. I get thrown out. Mm -hmm. Because that's not what that world is all about. Mm -hmm. That world is an academic world. And yes, you check your boxes off, and at the end of four years, you get your degree and you go on your way. And that's not what I was all about. So mm -hmm. I switched my major. I love classical music. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will sit and play it for myself. Mm -hmm. You know, but I, I'm not going to pursue that. That's the only type of music that I will not go out and professionally perform. Mm -hmm. So, Lou, do you teach as well? I do. I teach uh, about 20, 25 students a week. And, of course, I teach them classical music. <laughs> but um, I also teach them that I want them to interpret things their own way. Right. I, I want people to be creative, you know, and follow fundamentals that they basically will apply to every type of music that they're learning how to play. Which is why I, I would say you... Uh, are are more of you, you're saying teaching, but you're more of an educator because you're 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 not going to get stuck uh, 
teaching a student just a strict curriculum. In fact, I was talking to you about the fact, and I'm like this too with some students, that you, 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 you see what they do and you improve upon what they do. You're not going by a curriculum that someone gave you. I love it when they have either started with me and kind of believe me and deal with these fundamentals that I teach or they come to me and they've got some problems and I get them straightened out and I start to play on their own. They start to, to like evolve. Then I can sit back and I can critique them and coach them. But you're starting from, you're watching them. You're looking at what they're doing constantly and, and you're, and you're, and you're working with them specifically. It's I'll, look, one at their, of, I'll yeah. look at, I'll hear something and I, and I won't even have to look at their hands to know that something happened with their posture. Mm-hmm. either what they did with their wrist, what they did with their forearms, uh, the fact that they may have let the, there's two joints on your finger, and if you, let, if you don't keep them tough and play on the tips of your fingers, then you're going to let your finger bend, and you will flatten out, and you'll play on the flat part of your finger where there's no nerve endings, and therefore you can't do it. You know, If you've got big nails, if you're a girl or a woman, and, and you can't do it, period. I mean, you, you, what do you want to do, play the piano or have nails? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm that frank about it because there's no point in wasting your time any further mm-hmm. if, if that's the case, right. you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I like to, I mean, I work with vocalists and I work with piano players, you know. With a vocalist, uh, I'm not going to teach them how to sing, like, classically, you know, because that's not my, my shtick. That's not what I do. But I've worked with singers my whole life and I definitely know how to coach them. Mm-hmm. You know, and suggest keys to them for them to sing songs that they want to sing. Uh, and suggest for them to go out and write lyrics, you know, and sing a melody that they want into their their mm-hmm. phone or a tape recorder and bring it to me. Have a project together. Right. Get them involved in the educational process. I think it's great that you're a teacher that encourages originality. I think that's amazingly important. So, so you're going up and down. We're, 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 I'm just trying to get refocused on the on, on your history because there's a lot of that, and we haven't we've we've gotten to parts of it. So you're you're up and down the East Coast, and you're working with these clubs, and you're doing a lot of tribute band and tribute music. Continue on that. Tell tell us about what what happened after, from that point. Well, after after doing all that, as the disco era started to get done, uh, then I basically was working a lot out of Atlantic City. And uh, in Atlantic City, I was part of a organization. It was like a rhythm section co-op where they had like uh, X amount of guitar players, bass players, drummers, uh, rhythm section players who were hired through the agency by incoming acts from different places, casinos, cruise ships, the Boconos, the Catskills, wherever, Las Vegas, Mm -hmm. uh, Los Angeles in some cases. uh, And you would go and you would do a contract with them. Mm Mm-hmm. And sometimes they would offer you to go and play with them on a uh, on a trip that they were leaving Atlantic City. For example, I did one where I left Atlantic City and I went up to Bangor, Maine in the middle of the winter, which was just a joy. And did a couple of weeks there. I didn't work on my way back through Boston. And, you know, that's what I mean about moving up and down the East Coast. You right. know? Yeah. Accepting offers to do things. Because a lot of bands will come from Los Angeles or from somewhere out west, and when they get here, they're not going to have their own musicians with them. Right. They may have their core musicians, you know, the guitar player that, that lose all their licks, you know, their, mm-hmm. their, their right-hand man. You know, they might have two or three people with them, but they're going to hire pros to come in and sit down, do a couple rehearsals, read their charts, and do the gig. Right. You know, so you're a side man. Yep. And that's what I was doing. Got it. That's where all the traveling came in. Mm-hmm. And from okay, we talked about you being with the army band. When had it? Where does that jump from from that to the? I was continuing to play in Atlantic City and up and down, doing all the stuff that I was doing on the East Coast. Right. And um, at the time, I I I needed to. I had a lot of uh, a debt build up with student loans and things like that. And, right. No benefits. I was tired of paying five hundred dollars a month for medical insurance. Um, I basically, you know, wanted to do something to try to have some stability for a while. So I said, "Well, I have some friends in the military bands. Let me let me go talk." Mm-hmm. 
And I wound up talking to the Army, and uh, they paid off my student loans. They gave me the Montgomery GI Bill. Uh, I got medical, dental, eye care, uh, 30 days of vacation every year. My God, you know, I had never had a vacation. Um, so it basically, I, I decided I would do it. I, I, I enlisted for three years. And at the end of the three years, I said, well, maybe I'll try this again. And that went on until I got to 10 years. And then I was like, well, what the heck? I might as well finish this out and get a career out of it. And, mm-hmm. and I wound up in D.C. after seven years mm-hmm. and spent. Where were you before, before D.C.? When I first came in, I was sent to uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. Okay. Where I spent two and a half years and played very, very little piano. Uh, it was basically a ceremonial band okay. playing for all of these uh, things that were going on because it was a training facility. Okay. And um, so I was playing glockenspiel, bass drum, and cymbals primarily. Wow. Yeah. And when the concert band went out and did their thing, then I was playing in the battery, which means I was back there with the snare drum and the bass drum. See, and, I didn't know that. And the mallets and the all the gadgets. And I used to know how to do finger rolls on the tambourine and yeah. play a triangle and all that stuff. Uh, that went on until I got to the uh, 214th Army Band in Atlanta, Georgia, which was a traveling band. Wherever, <clears throat> wherever the band that is in Fort Meade, which is the Army's premier touring band, when it, wherever they were, we were not. So okay. our operations people worked with that band, mm-hmm. and if they were on the East Coast, we were on the West Coast. If they were in the North, in the middle of the country, in the North, we were in the middle country, in the South. <laughs> And basically, they would travel like 180 year, uh, days a, a year. And we were somewhere between 90 and 140 days a year. We were traveling on the road. Mm-hmm. So I got to see every state in the Union except for Alaska and Hawaii. I have not been there. Mm-hmm. And then I auditioned for and got the job in D.C. Gotcha. Where I spent 16 years. All on piano, right? Yes, that was my, my job then. Yep. Yep. And then the rest is history. Yes. So we've we we've we we I think we've we've managed in in all fairness I'm trying to I was trying to make complete our promise to the audience that uh that we've managed to cover I think at least in summation all a lot of this in 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 it took it took two complete episodes but but I think we've done this Lou Durham thank you very much. Thank for you for on. having me. I appreciate and it. And this was Really cool and enlightening and interesting, and and we're gonna have you. I think we're gonna have you back to do some other things. As we, uh, one thing I can promise, as we get these other, uh, as we get these other pieces of music originals uh, worked out with Lou, uh, we're going. We, we'll we'll put them on the air. We're gonna we're gonna have uh, this live on the air. So that's wonderful. Uh, of some of the thank music. you, Lou, and thank you for your service. Thank you yes. very much. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. This is Brian Choper. Uh, with the Business of Music radio show and And this is Mickey Hill right beside Ryan and right beside Lou it's been a very exciting show today and you can hear it on www.tbmradioshow.com Good night everybody we'll talk to you later